welcome, and thank you for tuning in to ESG Talks, a KBRA podcast series focusing on environmental, social, and governance, ESG. This podcast series highlights various ESG hot topics and includes commentary from prominent voices within the ESG community. In this episode of ESG Talks, Pat Welch, KBRA's Chief ESG and Ratings Policy Officer, interviews Michael Kashani, Managing Director and Head of ESG Credit at Apollo. Michael is responsible for supporting ESG integration across the credit business, as well as further incorporating ESG into Apollo's lending and other non-control investment processes. Michael currently represents Apollo across several industry initiatives, including as the inaugural steering committee chair of the ESG Integrated Disclosure Project, IDP. The ESG IEP is an industry initiative bringing together leading lenders in the private credit and syndicated loan markets to improve transparency and accountability. The group's goal is to promote greater harmonization and consistency of disclosure of key ESG indicators by borrowers in private credit and syndicated loan transactions. Greetings, Michael. Really great to have this opportunity to speak with you on this important topic of ESG disclosure. Uh, Now to set the table, you're the head of ESG credit at Apollo. So you know that ESG can often be confusing because it means different things to different people. So to frame our conversation, how does Apollo define ESG integration? Hello, Pat, and really appreciate uh, you having me on here. I think it's a really great question. We we call it our most boring but most important question, just given the varying views on what ESG actually is, particularly regionally. So we define it in really three ways. ESG integration at its core is about making better investment decisions, integrating material, environmental, social, and governance factors in the core investment thesis and analysis, both at the original underwrite as well as ongoing from a surveillance perspective. And that's core to our view of ESG being a value creation mechanism for us. Now, some of our LPs also have additional ESG requirements, and some of that can be the alignment. We call it ESG alignment within their fund or separately managed account, where they want certain ESG guidelines, whether they be positive screens, negative screens, targets, still no requirement from them or no desire from them to ever give up returns. These are not concessionary strategies, but they want certain ESG factors for varying levels of reasons. It could be something that aligns with their organization embedded within the management of that portfolio. Again, either a fund or a separately managed account. Or they could have the desire for reporting. So those areas are where it goes beyond what we do from a core investment thesis. And the last one, and sometimes that I see quite confused, is impact or a thematic strategy. And from our perspective, that is also an additional layer, definitely a smaller subset of potential investments that meet a higher criteria. So ESG integration occurs with every investment, whether investment is eligible for an impact or a thematic assessment. That would be, again, a smaller subset of what we view as ESG, that broader definition set. That fits really well with how KBRA views ESG. We firmly believe that ESG factors are specific to each issuer and transaction, and they require nuanced analysis to understand the financial or credit materiality. As a rating agency, we focus on ESG issues that affect or have the potential to affect the risk of default. But we also want to understand how an issuer is actively managing ESG issues, including the strategy for mitigating or capitalizing on ESG risks and opportunities. This helps us to understand the longer-term effects ESG factors may have on the credit profile of each specific issuer. Now, our approach is centered around three anchor ESG issues that tend to intersect with credit risk across most issuers. That's climate change with a particular focus on greenhouse gas emissions, stakeholder and reputation risk, and cybersecurity risk. But we include commentary on all credit-relevant ESG factors in our rating reports. So our goal is to get as much credit-connected ESG information into the marketplace as possible. I think very much in line with the broadness that you've just described of the ESG IDP. 
Okay, so let's talk about ESG IDP. Why was it created and what is its mission? I'm glad you asked. Uh, it was something that when I came to my seat here at Apollo just about two years ago, we started to see that there were dozens of private credit ESG disclosure questionnaires that nobody was filling out or very few people were filling. So what we saw in the market was a very noble intent, but a lack of consistency on the way the questions were asked and where they were coming from. And so there was an effort to see not what we do with the data, that is up to every asset manager to decide how to integrate ESG, whether they utilize that for diligence, portfolio management, reporting, meeting regulatory obligations. But we really thought we could ask the same questions or come to some level of consistency. And from our perspective, it was really important to determine that level of commonality, not so that we could stop different asset managers from asking additional questions or focusing in an area, but so we can start from the baseline so we could finally obtain more information because the availability of data for private credit, it's a challenge for us from a diligence perspective for managing portfolios, but also these growing porting requirements coming from multiple regulators across the world. What we saw was there were really fantastic frameworks already existing. And so instead of creating new frameworks, what we decided to do was leverage those existing frameworks. And that was a real positive because as those frameworks update, ISSB, the EDCI, which is the ESG Data Convergence Initiative, our template updates. And so it has this very positive impact of really elevating those frameworks that are now becoming more utilized. And so this template becomes something that updates as the market updates its intent on what it wants to bring in from a diligence perspective. So that's great. So it's really capitalizing on the frameworks that have existed and hopefully making it easier for people to address those frameworks. What are the benefits of the ESG IDP and what progress have you seen in the market since releasing this disclosure framework? We just celebrated our first birthday at the ESG IDP. So a very young initiative. One of the benefits we see is that we've really helped issuers, sponsors, their representatives understand what the market is looking for well in advance of when they come to price a deal. That is a great benefit to them. Previously, they didn't know which questionnaire they needed to fill. They didn't know the question could be asked differently, slightly, which would require significant work on their effort. What we've seen is actually many issuers, sponsors, they may not say it publicly yet, but have been very appreciative of these efforts to harmonize these questions in these different questionnaires, which were in many of our cases when we measured 80, 90% the same. We have three secretariats, the LSTA, the ACC, as well as the UNPRI. Really strong industry bodies, both in the credit side as well in sustainability. What I'd say is the really momentum that we saw is we saw after we launched a year ago, this adoption picking up. We also were very fortunate to have credit rating agencies, including KBRA, three of them join also to lend their expertise and support. And as an inaugural chair, I received feedback as the flexibility of the framework, the flexibility of the initiative to not prevent different stakeholders, asset managers to ask the questions or focus on the disclosures that are most meaningful to them. But we all have the same starting off point. We can then decide how we lean in or what we decide to focus on. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the huge benefit of the IDP is the wide applicability of its use, the flexibility, as you point out. It's obviously very useful to borrowers and lenders in the private debt and syndicated loan markets, but it's also helpful to other market participants like KBRA. Some of the information disclosed under the IDP is really relevant to the intersection of ESG and credit or financial risk, and that's helpful to us. Now, I should note that since some of the IDP information is not relevant, to KBRA's credit focus. So for that reason, KBRA doesn't require IDP disclosure in order to get a KBRA credit rating. 
But that said, the more ESG data that is in the marketplace, especially consistent and harmonized data, the better for all market participants. We firmly believe the disclosure efforts are helpful to everyone, really. And this is why we're excited to be a part of the executive committee of ESG IDP. I think that's an important point, Pat. We're now in a phase where we're educating issuers, their representatives, their sponsors on why we need this information. We're not coming at it as an activist investor. We are using this as a point of engagement with these parties, letting them know why these questions are important, sometimes asking them to focus on different questions. If we're looking at a company that is in a difficult to abate sector on carbon, And there are potential competitive risks. There could be regulatory risks. We're going to ask them to focus on carbon. If they manufacture or a heavy manufacturing facility, we might ask them to focus on how they treat their workers. What is their incident rate? What are they doing to mitigate? You mentioned cyber. If they're in an area where they hold or are in possession of consumer data or data that is relevant or extremely material for their business, We talk to them about their cyber risk. How are they mitigating that issue? Who's in charge of that? And I I think one of the areas that the ESGP is a bit different than some of the other data initiatives is it's both qualitative and quantitative. Uh, Hard data is great. Quantitative data is fantastic. But descriptions behind why they might have a piece of information or not, or where that data point is today, is just as important to know their trajectory. And so one of the real benefits of the ESG IDP is its ability to not only ask for that quantitative data, but allow those issuers that may be a little bit earlier on in their process, they may not have dedicated sustainability professionals, they may not have the big budgets that maybe some of the issuers in the public market may have, but they can start a conversation with us on where these issues are relevant for their business. Great. We've covered the basics of the IDP, but I want to ask you now about how it works in practice. In your role at Apollo, how are you using the information gathered from the ESG IDP disclosure in your investment processes? You know, it's an important question, Pat, to to take an initiative that has been really successful, amass a really strong level of support. But what, what do we do with this information? after we've attempted to acquire it? Or what what do we really think about ESG? And we mentioned ESG integration. The first point is, unfortunately, a lot of areas within ESG and sustainability are quite opaque. We have a lot of misinformation and even confusion in the market of what really ESG integration is. And so that was a real driving force behind our decision to publish a very detailed white paper to note, what do we think about ESG? Who does that? And for us at Apollo, it's a partnership between a dedicated ESG team and the fundamental investment team with the fundamental investment team's responsibility to own that ESG assessment or what we call our ESG risk rating. That is one of the fundamental areas that we focus on, assigning an ESG risk rating not to be a standalone separate assessment, but to be an extraction of the overall credit view. Whether it's information derived from core diligence, the investment team's understanding of the business or the issuer already today, the ESG team's understanding of the industry, or information gathered through the ESG IDP, all of that folds into our ESG risk rating analysis, what we apply to our investments. In some cases, particularly when you think now about private credit. So we'll depart a little bit from maybe what people are a little bit more used to on the public fixed income side is we don't typically get the same level of, let's say, disclosure from vendors out there on various factors, including information that's asked in the ESG IDP. And so for private and direct deals, we go a step further and do what we call enhanced ESG due diligence, looking to see if uh, investment is involved in any areas that could be problematic or open to additional risk. But also, are there positives embedded in the deal that actually mitigate risk? Or you know, one of the title of our ESG white paper is seizing opportunities. A lot of ESG analysis or ESG integration in credit is focused just on risk mitigation. There's really opportunities out there. There's companies leaning into businesses that have significant tailwinds. And so from our perspective, leveraging information that we request 
but never using that as a substitute for just good old fashioned credit diligence, combining those two together and embedding it in our fundamental investment view. That's fantastic and something that everyone probably wants to do. And that's really why the ESG IDP is such a great creation. Um, has it been difficult to get issuer buy-in uh, for the ESG IDP? And what are the incentives for issuers to disclose? I think we're still in the education side. I think we have some issuers who are very excited because they believe that this is a selling point for their business. This is actually something that makes them a more resilient and stronger business in the long term. Remember, Pat, many times we're working with investments that may have a little bit limited liquidity. I would argue that in the private and direct lending side, that upfront diligence is even more important. Setting the stage for what our expectations are with the issuer or their representatives, that much more important than in the public space. And so I think the area that I wouldn't call it a difficulty, I'd call it an area of education. But from the Apollo side, we've been really pleasantly surprised with the adoption, the dialogue that started from there, the I would call it quiet thanks, because now hopefully it's limiting the pretty similar but still different questionnaires that they were previously asked to fill out. And now they can focus their efforts well in advance of when they come to the market. They can focus their efforts well in advance of that. And that's a key strategic benefit for them. ESG is one factor of many, both from their side, but also our side. The question for us is how does that reflect across their business? And really coming back to them, how can we give them a roadmap of what our expectations are in the future so they're not guessing? which was one of the issues previously. So from my perspective as a credit person, we're typically quite pessimistic and probably more on the risk adverse side, which is not a bad thing, but we're very optimistic on the trajectory so far. Well, that's fantastic. And it's really great to hear that there's been adoption. So it's been a year since the ESG IDP was launched. What do you think is the outlook for the next year or two of IDP? Just given, um, as Pat, you know, we have people knocking on our door who want to be supporters. So we have a lot of different types of asset managers, rating agencies, groups that are represented by asset owners. It's a real eclectic and diverse mix of what I would view as the market. I would say continued growth of the supporter base so we can have the most, I would say, holistic view of what's needed in the market really expanding to real estate and real assets. Many of the supporters of the ESG IDP are excited to expand to an area of private credit. Again, not, not something that's in public credit, but in private credit, real assets, whether they be infrastructure or real estate. The other area just coming off of COP28 is the use of this data to identify whether certain investments are aiding in the climate transition. And so using this information, one of the areas Pat, we haven't discussed yet is the questionnaire or the template will continue to evolve. And uh, we've already seen requests for the template to evolve to different regulatory matters. But as companies, and we saw many announcements in the past couple of weeks, continue to know whether it's on the issuer basis or even on the issuance basis of a particular credit, whether their investments can be viewed as aiding in that climate or transition, whether it be from solutions, adaptation, mitigation, really a real growth factor for the ESG IDP to collect data, not just for what the issuer is doing, but maybe what the issuance is, is trying to accomplish as well. That's really great, Michael. It's been great chatting with you. I think KBRA believes that this is the creation of the ESG IDP and what it holds up for the future is super valuable for the marketplace. And we're really happy to be a part of it. Thanks for having us, Pat, and really appreciate the time to be able to discuss ESG IDP, as well as what we're doing here at Apollo.
Thank you to Pat and Michael for a very interesting discussion. This concludes our episode. Please email esg at kbra.com with any questions or comments. We also encourage you to visit KBRA's ESG website at esg.kbra.com, where you can find ESG research related to the topics discussed in this episode, further details on KBRA's ESG approach, and other ESG-related media items. You can also join our mailing list to access our ESG Weekly Roundup newsletter.